My name is Brendan Augustine, and I am the president of the WA branch of the AIA. And I have the genuine pleasure to be your host this evening. Good evening, Kamal, and thank you for generously agreeing to be part of this discussion. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking, the Wajak people of the Nunga Nation. I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Kamal, of course, does not need an introduction, given his more than 60 years in the Australian entertainment industry. Through his many records, live concerts, TV shows from the late 1950s onwards, Australia and many in the world have come to know him. Personally, I came to know Kamal while I was growing up in Malaysia and through that incredible Kamal at the Opera House album, which was a prized possession of my mother's. And I've been fascinated by Kamal's quite incredible journey from foreign student to entertainment icon since then. That fascination, I guess, is what led me to this idea with our special guest tonight, a discussion, a reflection with Kamal on his journey and how his story over these years potentially has something to say about Australia's image of itself and Australia's image in the world at large. Good evening again, Kamal. Kamal, I know your story very well, but for our audience, I suspect less so. I would like to start briefly at the beginning. You were born in what was then called Malaya in 1934 and arrived in Australia in 1953, if I'm correct, by ship to a port not very far from where I'm sitting at the moment, Fremantle. Maybe to start, can you tell us a bit about growing up in Malaya and especially what was your knowledge and expectations of Australia when you first found out you were being sent to further your education here? Come on. Anyway, hello, Brendan. It's an incredible opportunity to, to speak with you, especially now that you mentioned you're in Fremantle, where the ship SS Gorgon uh, anchored there uh, some 69 years ago. I had every reason to believe that I would have uh, left Australia by 1958 because uh, of the five years that I spent since arriving in 53, I hadn't achieved very much, not scholastically, because uh, I wasn't a very good student and uh, I had no real clear idea as to what was I going to do with my life. By uh, On the other side of the coin, I, I'm not a natural sportsman, but somehow through a miracle, I was able to have a hat trick in uh, 1957 with the first three balls of the season playing for a Kensington club. Don't ask me what great, but I got hat trick with the first three balls. And at the end of the game, would you believe I had the unbelievable pleasure of meeting Sir Donald Bradman. And when I met him, I couldn't believe it was him because he was so small and he had a high voice. I expected him to be six foot seven or something like that with a deep baritone. And uh, that was 1958. 33 years later, 33 years later, I had the privilege again and pleasure of meeting Sir Donald Broadman at his home, only about a couple of hundred yards away from the school I went to, Holden Street, number two. I didn't know till many years later that Sir Donald Bradman lived next door to the school I went to. It was then called King's College. Now it's called Pembroke. Maybe, you know, maybe I, I mean, can go back to your school. So Lee, you're, you're, you're a young man uh, finishing. You've just finished, um, I think, what, what used to be called Senior Cambridge in Malaya. Yeah. Um, yeah. your, you, you've been told by your, I think, your uncle who, uncle, who yeah. org organized uh, your student uh, visa and your, 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 your sojourn in Australia. What went through your mind? You're, you're going off to the strange land of Australia. What was your picture of Australia as a young well, Malayan? I, I, had, 
I had seen pictures of uh, Melbourne because there were friends of mine whose relatives had gone to Melbourne. So I knew a little more about Melbourne, very little about Adelaide. Of course, I knew about Sydney. And uh, I think I was, uh, it was to me an escape from the uh, very strict discipline at home. I thought I'm, I'm going to be free. <laughs> I was going to be born free. But uh, no real, in fact, uh, my uncle obviously did pay attention to my scholastic uh, achievements because I just managed to uh, scrape through whatever uh, exam I, I did before leaving VI. But yeah. uh, it was just the, you know, the, the tradition thing to for the eldest boy to be given every opportunity, never mind about the girls, but the boy. And uh, so to me, it was an escape uh, to, to, to freedom. So you and didn't have I, either a negative or a, a positive impression of, you know, what Australia in Australia was, you know, was uh, still very much I was aware, I was aware of the white Australia policy that Australia might have had. I wasn't really familiar with the with the politics of Australia. I had no idea that they had indigenous people till, you know, at least five years after I was there. I didn't see any indigenous people in the streets of Adelaide. And I was oblivious to what happened outside uh, King's College uh, uh, or around my uh, group of friends. It was then that I got a better idea. I think it was uh, much later in 1967. Uh, I was uh, involved in a movie, I was you know, taking part in a movie called Journey Out of Darkness. And I played the part of an Aborigine uh, who kills his opponent in fair fight? That was the tradition, and but but white man's law uh, uh, insisted that I should be the, the 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 boy who killed the other one should be punished, and I was dragged through all around Australia, and um, so there were some scenes that uh, that was quite confronting because uh, they were going to get a double for me to be dragged by the horse uh, in in in, in mid sun. That there was no no stand in, so I had to do it myself. I think I may have still scars from that one. But anyway, <laughs> what was important was what was significant was that the girl playing opposite me was an indigenous girl. I can't even remember her name, but she didn't speak much English, and uh, and she had to be you know bare chested and all of that. Oh, by the way, I've got to tell you, the producer uh, Frank Britain, not Britain, Britain, Frank Britain, American. He tells a story about girls coming part, coming for auditioning for the part at where, where you were supposed to be semi naked. And some of them were so shy they would only show one boob at a time. <laughs> but so anyway, if, we can, that. But if I can take finish. you back maybe to the early 50s. Um, so you arrive in Adelaide. Um, so you're there with a group of Malayan students. Um, you, you, how do you get to know about sort of Australian culture? I guess you're you're mixing with um, Australian students. Um, what what are, what are some of your first impressions then of uh, Australia? It, I mean, actually, I didn't travel very much around. I mean, I, I you know I worked in a, a cool drink a factory called Halls H A A L S. And I was nicknamed Purcell. Purcell was the name of a soap. So it was an irony that I should be called Purcell. I was black and they had a name and white. So those sort of uh, racist uh, overtones was there, but I took it, you know, I, mean, I shrugged it off my shoulders. But it was, uh, again, uh, having gone to the university, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life because in Malaysia, I won one or two drawing competition. I, you know, I made some posters and drawings that attracted a bit of attention. So when it was time for me to enroll at the university, I thought maybe because I can draw, let's do architecture. I had no idea what architecture demanded. So as a result, two or three or two years in the architectural course, naturally I failed everything. And then I tried an arts course. Uh, I failed that too. And this is when 1958 
the registrar of the university, Harry Wesley Smith, called me into the office. He said, uh, I have two letters, one from your uncle, Mr. Arupile, and the other from the immigration department, one demanding that you be you got sent back to Malaysia, and the other, my uncle, wanting to know how well I was doing. So uh, Harry Wesley Smith, very wisely, perhaps, uh, said to me, I don't know what to do, but my sons tell me that you've been singing around the club. Let me hear you sing, come to my place. This was like a week before Christmas. So I went to his home and sang something, I can't remember exactly what. At the end of which he said, come on, if you're singing, your voice is okay, but why do you make, your, why do you make these funny faces? The reason I would have done that because I was imitating Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole opened his mouth very wide like a crocodile to make, make his sounds. And so I thought that was the way to do it. So I did that from 1954 all the way to 1960. Then in 1960, I met a man called Paul Robeson. And most people may not know Robeson now because he was a, he was, he predated uh, Martin Luther King. For my money, it was Paul Robeson who broke the, uh, how can I say, the, the racist uh, problems of America. Unfortunately, Paul was naive, even though he was a brilliant scholar, a brilliant sport, an actor. He played Othello with the leading lady in, in England, and, uh, and he sang beautifully. And in fact, when I tried to introduce him in my, during the launch of my biography, uh, An Impossible Dream in 1995, I said, Robeson had a voice like the earth would have if the earth could sing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't begin to describe what it was like to meet him at the uh, town hall in, uh, in Adelaide, in a suburban town hall. And when I met him, I could feel his voice through the floorboards. It was an incredible feeling, and uh, and, and Robson, and, you 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 mentioned Robson. It's very poignant because, and you mentioned that he, you know, he was uh, with there, you know, at the beginning, at, at the apex of the, the the civil rights movement, even before the civil rights movement emerged. Yeah, I was, mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm really disappointed. His name doesn't feature these days, but he was larger than life. Uh, in fact, uh, I heard that a couple of years ago, his son was eventually given his uh, uh, the, the father's uh, uh, award for being the outstanding sportsman. And it was specially finally hung on the Sports Hall of Fame 45 years after the incident. His award for being, I mean, that's the kind of racism or the, 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 the uh, yeah, the, the prejudice that exists in America even today. So, and, so going back to when you started singing, um, in I guess you know the story of you know you're a student uh, there at Adelaide University, and and what was you know obviously inspired as you said by Nat King Cole, but what what started you um, right. to want to sing and to develop the, the the singing? Okay, where we stayed in Kensington Park, there were across the road was a, a milk bar. And uh, Gladys um, uh, Morecambe uh, and her husband Malcolm owned uh, the business, and we went there as, you know, university students in, in a crowd there every weekend. And they eventually invited us to their home. And every Friday and Saturday, and sometimes Sunday, they would have these evenings, and uh, occasionally they would cook the, the curry their way. And uh, but most importantly, when it was all over, we would all get together and some people would sing or do thing. And I was so shy, I would stay in the corner and dare not say a word. But in the meantime, by the end of 53, I began to listen to Western music, even though I didn't like Western music, but I listened to the songs and I liked the words, more, words far more uh, important than the, and the, than the melody. So I heard, I heard the song Nature Boy, and it said the final words were the greatest thing you ever learn is to love and be loved in return. And I memorized it. It took me ages to memorize it. I'm a very slow learner anyway. And at the end of it, I think it must have been 
early 1954 at one of these functions, I went to Mrs. Moore from Gladys and I said, I'd like to sing. She said, what? I said, can you sing? I said, I don't know, but I want to try. And before singing, I said to her, can I ask you a small favor? I said, what's that? I said, can you turn the lights off, please? She said, why, my dear boy? Why do you want to turn the lights off? I said, so that nobody could see who was singing. And that, the, how pathetically shy I was. And I finished up singing. At the end of it, one or two of them said some nice things. And somebody said, you sound a bit like Nat King Cole. And that was the, 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 that was the week that was uh, lit. And that was the encouragement I needed. And from then on, I privately, quietly learned uh, as many of the Nat King Cole songs. And I sang it uh, out in the field with my blanket over my head so that nobody would hear, could hear me. Never thinking I, that it would ever, ever become a career, no. Can I go back? So you were, from, from what I've read, so you said Nat King Cole was your first exposure to Western music. You grew up in a very musical family, but it was traditional uh, Carnatic Indian music uh, yeah. milieu from which you came. Um, and can you describe that a little bit, growing up in well, that milieu? I mean, uh, my, you know, my father was uh, head of the music school, the Sabah in Brickfields. And, uh, and, and I, it was kind of humiliating for me because my aunt, my mom's older sister, uh, Mrs. Arupale and insisted that I should go to the Sabah school. So I was among all these girls and feeling very self-conscious. And uh, so I spent maybe two years going there just listening. And I don't think I learned anything. But what I do remember was uh, maybe the final year I heard a singer from Sri Lanka. Uh, I think his name was Shanmugaratnam. And when he sang, I got chills. I mean, that was the... That was the first time that when I heard a voice, that really touched me. And other than that, I didn't really care for the Indian classical music, uh, except the movie, you know, Theogarada, Bhagavad, and all of those. And I learned some of those. And uh, so that was that. So it was a, uh, it didn't prepare me for what I eventually became, you know, meaning mm -hmm. even now, what I do, I don't believe I really think so much as communicate. It is always the words that come to me that matters, matters to me before the music or the orchestra or anything else. And um, to that end, uh, I got to tell you this story. When my mom eventually had to reconcile herself to the fact that I was going to sing white man's music songs, she called me, this is 1960, 61. She took me aside and said, son, now that you're going to do that, can you sing me something? So I very quietly uh, sang something. Can't remember what. And I could see her face. She was contorting it as though she was in agony. At the end of which she said, son, doesn't it hurt your throat to make noises like that? And to me, what she said made a lot of sense. Because what I do is make noises. And the noise I make is a combination of Nat King Cole and Paul Robeson. And I think like the Australian lyrebird, you know, a lyrebird hears, hears any sound and can imitate it immediately, even the sound of a machine or a machine gun. And if you haven't heard a lyrebird, I can't explain it to you. But the lyrebird is like a mirror to sound. It can imitate anything. And maybe I unconsciously or subconsciously, I'm able to or make up this sound that I make, the noise that I make, that, that troubled my mother, but seemed to have pleased a few other people around the world. So going back, that, that's a great, great story. Going back to sort of the mid fifties, you're starting to sing, you're singing, you're singing with a blanket over your head. Um, um, do, do, you, do you get a sense that you and your fellow Malayan, Malaysian students, um, they feel at home, uh, in you know, it's a very changing <coughs> world. Obviously, there's independence movements in uh, in the countries where they came from. Uh, Australia's uh, position vis-a-vis -vis these countries was was mixed. Um, or, or were you in a, a bubble? You sort of not paying too much attention to them. I was I was aware of what was going on in Malaysia, 
and uh, I was I was a bit concerned as to to how extreme it might get that we all had to speak Malay and you have to be a Malay to have any advantage over any other non-Malays and all of the which which did eventually happen and then they overcame that that sort of a uh, uh, racial uh, difference but uh, I couldn't do anything you know I mean I was isolated in uh, in in Australia and I was playing hide and seek and I was I managed to overcome the 19 58 threat of being reportation when the registrar having heard me sing said uh, you know you haven't got a bit bad voice but why do you open your mouth like a crocodile but he did take me to the conservatorium and introduce me to max worthley uh, the best voice teacher in in adelaide except uh, when i met max for the first time uh, he played the scales and I had never done it and I was sang with him and then at the end of it he gave me a book it said Messiah by George Frederick Handel Handel's Messiah if you'll forgive the pun I couldn't handle it but I did <laughs> within a year and a half I sang all of the arias from the Messiah at various churches how I sang it I wouldn't know maybe I crooned it but I don't know but I sang, the trumpet shall sound, why do the nations behold darkness shall cover the earth, and all of those. And I can't believe I did it. In fact, about 20 years ago, uh, you know, the uh, ABC broadcast in, in Sydney, I sang, the trumpet shall sound with the lead trumpeter from the Sydney Symphony and Robin Higgs on the piano, live and unplugged. And uh, in fact, I wish I, I had a... Uh, uh, a, f a few bars of that for you to play it right now. Even when I hear it, I can't believe that's me doing that. I don't know. I don't know how it happens. It's. I find it the whole thing a bit bizarre, you know. And uh, me so, singing. Uh, so that's sorry, you know you're you're in the conservatory. I am. Um, um, there are not a lot of. How should I say? Uh, non-European faces on in entertainment. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming there wouldn't have been many at the conservatorium. Um, um, and and do you start imagining that you could have a career in music of some sort in Australia? Frankly, frankly, uh, you know, I mean, I uh, I was just marking time to avoid deportation. And miraculously, in 1958, at a restaurant called the Lido, my savior arrived, uh, where before I actually met him, there was a lovely young lady, blonde, beautiful, uh, the week before Christmas, came up to me where I was singing, and she said, uh, do you remember me? I had no idea who she was, because I had never met any, any young, beautiful ladies. And... Uh, she said, oh, you came to the department store where I was working you to get your school uniforms and all of that. I had no idea, but I don't know who she was. Eventually, uh, she said, when you finish singing, come to the table. And I sang to, went to the table and sat there. And there were about a dozen uh, men and women. At the end of it, they all went to a, a function at the Adelaide Hills. I presume it was a Christmas party. Now, on hindsight, it was a news, a news limited Christmas party. Uh, and this gentleman who was with her came to me and he said, do you mind singing one of your songs? Uh, this is near midnight. So I sang something. And at the end of which the, the people there, but the 80, 70, 80 of them, they were very generous in their response. They applauded rather warmly. And this guy who had paid no attention to me then rushed over to me, grabbed me by my hand and put a piece of paper in my hand. And, and started asking questions. I opened the hand and there was a 10 pound note, which is like $150. I would have been happy to get $1 those days. But anyway, and he was really serious about wanting to know who I was and where I was when I told him I was at the university and uh, at the conservatorium, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and then within a few months, the next year, 1959, he bought a television station and I did. I was invited to do the very first live television show. I think it was October 1969, on a Saturday night. And uh, and the the critics were very generous. 
And with this, uh, this gentleman he turned out to be Rupert Murdoch, and I saw him whenever he came to the station, and when I was I was driving, and then two years later or three years later, uh, during one of his many visits back to Adelaide, and he said to me, "You should come to Sydney and sing there." I was terrified of going to Sydney. I didn't want to be a failure in Sydney. I just enjoyed the success, be a, a, a big frog in a small pond. He said, no, no, you got to come. And he wouldn't listen to me. So I got an invitation to come to Sydney and sing at the Hotel Australia in Castlereagh Estate for six weeks. And, uh, and during the six weeks, uh, Pat and Rupert would come almost every Thursday, Friday and Saturday, sometimes with guests, sometimes without. And uh, and on the final night, so I went to thank both of them. And I wanted to say, I didn't know the expression then, I wanted to thank them for their irrational generosity. It's an expression I only heard recent times, but their generosity was irrational. So with that, I, I turned to leave and Rupert grabbed me by the shirt sleeve. Where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going back to Adelaide. He said, no, 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 you're going to stay in Sydney. You'll be a big star. I didn't believe a single word he said. And, uh, and next thing, uh, he sends me a ticket to come back to Sydney. And, uh, and, and I said, where will I stay? He said, stay with us. So I lived at 71A, Yaranabi Road, Darling Point for the next three years. So how lucky can you get? I mean, uh, it's bizarre, you know, it's, it's totally, even now when I think about it, how could that happen? And uh, yeah, so can those I were the... Sorry. That that's that's been a yeah that's been a, a key part of your story that that fateful meeting, but if I could go back a, a little bit um, to you know you you've had this TV appearance did you feel self conscious at all as being one of the only um, I guess non European faces you know, on television uh, in, in the Australian uh, context anyway and 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 the sense of the the his or you were just living through it, and or the the the, the no, sense no, of history no, and, and occasion. No, no, no. no look, my I, all that time till 1966, uh, uh, till 1960, I was living in in permanent fear of being deported without anything, without a degree. You know, till 1966, nothing. In 1966, the strangest thing happened. Um, I had a sort of an incident the Saturday night before. I was I was singing at a, the hotel, the Lennon's Hotel in Brisbane, and for the whole week. And there was a Sri Lankan family there, and there was a, a young lady, and there were children. And on the Saturday night, the final night, uh, this young girl came and said, "Oh, Mr. Kamal, you are having a party. Can I come?" I had no idea how. She found out I was having a party. So I said, anyway, she seemed about like 15 or 16. I was a bit worried. I said, as long as your parents know where you are, you're welcome. And so she came. And uh, there were, you know, all of us. So it was near midnight. I was a bit concerned. I said, you got to go now. But she said, no, 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 five more minutes. I said, no, you got to go. So I took her to the elevator, made sure she got off at her level. And when she, when they, uh, the, uh, the elevator door opened. There was a Sri Lankan man on the other side. And as she walked out, it, she, he smacked her right, right across her face. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, we don't want people like you in this country or something like that. And there was no explanation given. And I was deeply concerned. I thought, this is it. You know, the, he's going to report whatever fantastic story he could make up to get me out of here. And the following Tuesday, I got a telegram from the immigration department demanding that I appear at their offices immediately, which was at Elizabeth Street. And I went there believing 100% I would be deported. And uh, so I got in and I went to the office. There was an immigration lady who didn't look all that very happy. And uh, uh, maybe she got from the wrong side of the bed, not that she had the right side. But anyway, she was there and she went through some papers and then she finally said, uh, you've been here since 1953. Uh, what have you achieved? I said, not much. She said, that's a bit of an understatement. But anyway, 
<laughs> with that, she took another piece of paper and she said, the, the government of Australia has decided. With that, I went psychologically deaf. I could see her mouth moving, but I couldn't hear what she said. They to, the Australian government has decided to give you permanent resident status. With that, she looked to me as beautiful as Ingrid Bergman. And I ran out of there. I ran out of there and went to the nearest telephone and called the women, uh, the uh, Crown Street Women's Hospital for two reasons. Dr. Victor Panicott, who was my hockey captain in 1955 in Sydney when I played for Australia against New Zealand hockey, he was my captain and he was the registrar at the Crown Street Women's Hospital. The other, a lady I had met who was to be engaged to somebody in Fiji, uh, her name was Sahudra Tikaram, I had also met her. So when I called the hospital, I don't know how I happened to have the number I called. Uh, I couldn't speak to Dr. Panikot, but I could speak to Sahudra Tikaram, a nurse. So Sister Tikaram came on the phone and I said, how are you? She said, fine. I said, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? I said, why? She said, I said to her, do you want to get married? She said, when? I said, what about next week? And we were married two weeks later. I mean, so, <laughs> I, was, I was expecting her to say, I'm marrying the other guy I'm engaged to. I'm going back to Fiji. That's what I, I expected 100% for her to tell me. So when she said that, that was it. So that was in 1966. Uh, can, and, uh, can, I, and I, whole, can I just circulate around, around that, that issue? So you're, you're, you, you've had this fear hanging over your head over, let's say, you know, eight years, years, eight years, 10 years, you know, okay. um, and, you know, you've been dodging immigration, uh, finding ways to, uh, to stay in Australia. Um, and, you know, this was the time of the white Australia policy, of course, students were allowed to come, uh, they were allowed to get an education. But as soon as their, their education was done, they were not allowed, unless they were you know, really exact exceptional circumstances, they were not allowed to stay. So did you did you see that change, that change in government policy as part of a broader change that was taking place in Australia? Um, and, and, and of course, you were in touch with other people of, of Asian background. I know you, you had friends and, and not, was this a sentiment of that generation that was seeing this change? It was bound to happen. A little by later, the Colombo plan and the, and the private plan, like my uncle, uh, did make a, an, an impact on the, 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 the political climate of Australia. And I, I, I must confess, I was a bit insular. I was more interested in, in learning some songs and singing and, uh, and hiding from, um, uh, from public gaze at the same time it's kind of ironic you're on television and how yeah. can you hide and, not a very uh, good strategy to hide if you're on television I was, I was getting magazine covers and stories and all of that but the the thing is i was a bit uh, a, a cockeyed optimist you know meaning i thought something you know, you know the word serendipity you know meeting rupert and meeting uh, and and the, uh, the the immigration official in uh, in in Adelaide, who I think privately favoured me and hid my problems uh, out of sight from harm's way, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I was lucky in in uh, in in many ways of of, of meeting people, uh, not least my wonderful wife uh, and and two beautiful children. Uh, but I never ever thought that uh, that I would get a chance to singing for in fact i first sang for prince charles uh three two months before he, he married diana and then the following year in 1982 i sang for the queen at the commonwealth games and and you believe it or not i have a footage of her listening to me and responding and uh, and her applauding at the end of it and she went on applauding when her husband philip had uh, stopped and everybody else had stopped and she used to I mean, how, 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 I can't come to terms with that. And, uh, but I, in fact, uh, I was on the news uh, on Channel 7 last Sunday because after, after she passed away, she left us. Uh, I was on Channel 7 News and, uh, 
we didn't have the footage to show it, but I wished I had. But yeah, I mean, I can't believe I have experienced these sort of things. But not only the uh, the Queen and Prince uh, Prince Charles or King Charles, but the rest of the family, uh, Princess Anne and and the rest of the family, I had a chance to sing for and entertain. And talking about royalty, but without trying to upstage, but I did one better than Queen Elizabeth was Queen Juliana in in the, in the Netherlands uh, in 1975 when I had the elephant song. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to the elephant song. We'll come back to the elephant song. If I can just stay in that period, um, you know, you're getting your your permanent resident. Did you have much contact uh, uh, with uh, people back in in Malaysia? And um, did you travel back there? You know, at, in the in the nineteen sixties. No, no. I, of course, once the children were born, um, I took the, them, Rajan and Rani. When Rajan was five and Rani was two, and we we had a good time. And at the end of it, as we were back on the plane and on the way, just before landing, I said to my son, Rajan, how did you like visiting Malaysia? Oh, very good. Way. I said, would you like to go back to Malaysia? He says, no, why not? I said, too many Indians there. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> so, so, so you know, I mean, there's, a, there's a lesson to be learned there, you know, I mean, uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I think the... I, I really don't know uh, how my life turned out to be what it is. And, you know, I'm 87, I'll be 88 in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, but before that, there are a bunch of things I want to do. In fact, I've already done a, a commercial that goes to air on the 17th of October. You won't actually see me, but you would hear me for a, a, a company car. It's a car company, secondhand cars. Uh, which is almost as good as new, called Karma, C-A-R-M-A, C-A-R-M-A, uh, Karma. So Kamal brings Karma to Karma. So anyway, I don't know what, what they're going to call it, but that's what it is. So that's going to be national advertising, and there won't be any escape from Kamal from the, <laughs> from the Australians <laughs> in October, November, December. So, yeah, I mean, how these things happen, like even now at this stage of my life, you know, I'm writing my second, uh, no, somebody's writing my second biography. And and I have, initially I was going to call it Why Are People So Unkind? But we have decided to call it, but for the kindness of strangers, because it's the kindness of strangers, but for the kindness of strangers go I. And, uh, and I remember a lady called uh, Gladys Newton. She was the mother of Pam Newton. Pam was the, learning the harp in Adelaide. And I was invited to her home. And um, her boyfriend's name was Stan, and so was her father's name was Stan. But uh, but her mother, uh, Gladys, whenever I went there, it was Sunday lunch. And after lunch, I would go back to the, you know, uh, to the cupboard and get my jacket on and I put my hands in my pocket. There'd be at least a five pound note or a 10 pound note so you can imagine, I never missed a Sunday lunch for the next two years. <laughs> so that was the kind of irrational generosity of some of the people of Adelaide. I mean, uh, there were so many, you know, uh, uh, like the I, Gordon I think, Brown. Yeah. The, the story that you, you, you know, in my research, you know, the, you, you are very, very, you know, you're very, forward in 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 talking about the generosity and and i think you know your life story does bear that out um you know the one was it true through the generosity or through your courage and i guess uh for want of a better word bravado um that that also helped you you know, because you know, looking back, you know, I, and I come, I come to this obviously with my own experiences here, and and we we do see the fact, the fact of the matter is, at that point, you no, know, even today, but at that point in in Australia's history, there were very few people like yourselves, um, you know, who had emerged, uh, who had been able to to uh, break through um, popular culture. Um, you were able to do it. 
you, you obviously had the generosity, as I mentioned earlier, you had the serendipitous meetings. Um, and, you know, at one stage, I, I, I did some research and, and a, a journalist, you know, after an interview, you know, labeled you angry young man um, uh, after a conversation that you had around the similarities that that the media, I guess, was making to, I guess, the, the Afro-American entertainers. Um, but it seems as if you you very quickly over overcame those uh, those those kind of barriers. Yeah, I mean, let, let me give you two examples. You know, earlier I told you about that movie, Journey Out of Darkness. Yeah. What I wanted to tell you, I don't know whether I did, was that during a lunch break, uh, all of the uh, directors, producers, everyone was, everyone was invited to the uh, homestead to have their lunch break in the burning sun. And the girl and I were given a plate of sandwich to eat outside. Hmm. Try and work that out. So that sort of uh, racism and prejudice existed. And eventually when I, you know, I, I, I led with my chin doing shows like Hey Hey Saturday. And there on the eve of my second concert at Carnegie Hall, I, I was doing the song, uh, I'm doing the show to get, because I was, doing the second show in 1984, and Bob Hope, the one of the biggest American stars, was kind enough and generous enough to introduce me at Carnegie Hall for my second concert at Carnegie Hall. So I appeared the week before at Hey Hey Saturday to talk about it. So, you know, and guess what? As I was singing uh, at, on the Hey Hey Saturday, somebody crept up with a powder puff with a bluff and hit me in my face with the power of going through my into my throat. And uh, it's a humiliation I cannot describe. I can't, I haven't gotten over it. But I laughed it off then. And but it still burns. And uh, that's I've had that all of my life. There's a group of people who the public have been overly generous with supporting me. But a section of my own industry, the entertainment industry, uh, have been very unsupported. I'll give you a perfect example. In 1976, after my first concert at Carnegie Hall, I was on 60 Minutes. Ray Martin was uh, presenting the show, and he called me aside and he said, you know, I got to tell you, we asked the president of the Musicians Union about you doing Carnegie Hall, what he thought of it. Hey, Kamal doing Carnegie Hall? Oh, he's got no talent whatsoever. So I said to Ray Martin, I said, he's right. I've got no talent whatsoever, but don't tell too many people about it. You know, that's the only way I get out of these sort of very embarrassing situations because time and again, time and again, uh, that I've been insulted, humiliated, but it hurts, but you don't dwell on it, you know, and... Uh, uh, a few weeks ago on, on the SBS program, they were uh, holding a program to say uh, the, the grudge you hold. And that was the subject of the, of the program, the grudge you hold. So they asked me to be a guest. So I said, admit, I said, I don't hold grudges. I hold memories that are worth holding. And uh, so the, the conversation was very short. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the thing is this. I understand when some musicians say, I have no talent. I really don't have any talent. But somehow, a lot of people disagree with it. And uh, what I do want to do is communicate what we are doing right now, to communicate with people with what you know to be that's true. And the first thing I, uh, first song I ever learned, the, the Nature Boy, the greatest thing you ever learn is to love and be loved in return. That's my lesson. That's what I learned. And that's what I want to spread if I can, in spite of uh, the likes of, uh, you know, unfortunately the world has leaders who are, uh, how can I put, corrupt and vile. And uh, they were in charge of the greatest country for four years <laughs> and uh, ruined it. But, uh, you know, but then, you know, uh, you have to face it. And, the, uh, and before him, there was a black man who became president against all odds. Mm -hmm. If I was a betting man, I would have bet one dollar and got a million for it. But he stood for there for eight years. And I had a chance to have dinner with Barack Obama. 
and as a result, as a result, learned the Gettysburg Address and recited it uh, to Americans. It's like carrying coal to Newcastle. But I recited the Gettysburg Address to Americans. If you know the Gettysburg Address, but anyway, it's on YouTube. You can look at it. <coughs> One thing you you talked about your international work. I wanted to delve into that a little bit because. Um, you know, beyond your success in Australia, of course, you had great success in uh, internationally, you know, as you mentioned earlier, particularly with the uh, 1975 hit the elephant song, but more than the stories of, you know, the, the, the songs and, and how it developed, you know, you were out there as, as an Australian entertainer, you know, by now you'd become an Australian citizen, you were known as an Australian entertainer, what was the reaction uh, that you got both from you know Australians overseas, the Australian government. Um, um, I know when I worked at BFAT, we used to savor the opportunity when Australian entertainers used to come to town wherever I served, and and we tried to take advantage of their popularity in the local in the local countries uh, to to build on Australia's name. Um, what was your experience like, uh, you know, as, as an Australian entertainer? Did, did they see you as Australian? Was well, that part of you know, your identity? Yeah, me, I've, been, I've been painted as a closet liberal. <laughs> you know, I supported uh, Bill and Sonia McMahon in, in, the, in 1973-74. And at the same time, you know, I, I did uh, support a, a Labour Premier as well. So I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not politically right or left, you know, I, I like the individual, you know, I mean, uh, I like Abraham Lincoln, who's a Republican, and I like Obama, who's a Democrat. So it's the individual, you know, what they have to offer. And uh, uh, there was something I was just going to say, it's gone out of my head. But yeah, politically, um, I think a lot of people see me as a as a, a liberal supporter, because I live in a liberal district and all of that. But in my heart, it's the individual, and uh, and I th I think it's a shame that we have to have parties that 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 divides people instead of being people being having a having an idea that brings people together. It doesn't matter. Of course, we are different. You know, I'd like to think of an anal analogy. Take three different eggs: a white egg, a black egg, and a brown egg. When you break it, the yolk is the same. You know, it is every, every, all three of them are the same. We physically look different, but it's the brain that matters. I'll give you a perfect example that illustrates. In uh, 2000 and uh, about eight, nine years ago, no, not even that. Uh, no, 2019, an eight year old boy, his name was Tani Tolua Ade Wumi or something like that, eight years old, Nigerian refugee. He goes to America. Within a year, he becomes a chess master. Mm. Now, can you get your head around that? A Nigerian refugee goes to America. His parents are living as refugees, and the son is the New York State champion of chess. How that is the kind of example that should be celebrated. But the Americans didn't do that. Mm. You know, it may be, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, it is not the color of our skin, but it is what what's inside, the, what's your, wh how you think. It's your attitude, you know, and... and, uh, and, and absolutely, and your, your, your attitude, you know, as, as you've described your journey, you know, I think um, demonstrates how important it was in, in, in how you forged your success. But if I could return to, to my question from a few minutes ago. So you're traveling internationally, you've had this big hit. What was it like being sort of a say, you know, like an Australian uh, entertainer, not in the classical sense, you know, not an Australian that was an image of Australia, but you know, um, what was the reception you got? And did, did, did they, did the audiences, in, I know you you were big you, you had a big following in Scandinavia and the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I suppose the single most uh, prestigious moment as far as the live concert I 
after the elephant song was released and it was number one for six weeks and there was a royal command performance and her majesty queen juliana and her husband prince bernhard were there and uh, i don't know how to say this i got two standing ovations from both of them i mean how do you how do you come to uh, how, how 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 do you explain that you know and uh, and and how the elephant song happened is another miracle. What happened was in 1975, Prince Bernhard wanted, he was the chairman of the World Wildlife Organization. He wanted to do a concert to raise funds for, for conservation. So they invited 30 to 40 different artists. All their records were put on a on a on a on a table to for them to go through all of them and to choose one uh, one artist. To, to sing the elephant song. And the last album was put on the, by a man called uh, Pete Scalavis. Uh, Pete Scalavis was the uh, president of the Phonogram Records. He had heard of, I had just done a concert at, at, at the London Palladium, and, and he put my record on the top of it, top of the 35, 40 albums, and uh, this is the guy who just done the concert. So the 12 uh, directors, producers all sat together, and they're waiting for a long day to listen to 30, 40 albums. They listened to the first album and they looked at each other and they said, that's it. Can you, can you work that out? Can you work it out? They had, they had Sinatra and everybody else in there. They didn't listen to anybody else. I mean, how, how, how do you explain that? You know, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, you can say it was good karma or serendipity or anything else. But I've been, if you'll, expe if you'll expe excuse my uh, expression, I was bloody lucky so many times, so many times. At the same time, I, I got kicked in the teeth occasionally, but the teeth are still there, but, uh, and it hurts. But no, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still going and, and the best is yet to come. <laughs> So can I ask you then? So when you were traveling the world, so you were doing London uh, Palladium. You were you were you were you were you know at the back on the back of the Elephant Song, uh, doing many concerts and and tours and sales in in Europe, uh, continental Europe. Um, did you consider you know? Did you consider yourself? What did you consider? You consider an Australian artist? Um, you know how how would you have categorized yourself at that stage? Part of the problem was. I really didn't have a, a manager. I was, I had unfortunate experiences. And uh, so I, it was a one man band uh, and it was difficult. So if I had one or two or three people to work with, maybe uh, it would have been, it could, I could have exploited my success. Instead, I did it more or less on my own. I mean, <laughs> I did it my way. But it wasn't the best way. And uh, so it, it was difficult that, you know, there were so many times when I could have made, I, I could have made 10 times the amount of money, you know, I mean, money was the last thing in, in my mind. But uh, yeah, it, it could have been different. I mean, it, it, I was unlike so many other major artists who made a fortune. And uh, by the same token, but let me explain something. In 1981, 1981, I was invited, uh, not I wasn't invited, my agent, I found Judy Friedman. She was the wife of uh, Sid Friedman, who was an NBC radio, a television presenter, who came to the 1976 Carnegie Hall concert. Uh, at the end of it, they both introduced themselves. And then I couldn't go back to New York for the next three years because of contractual obligations, I couldn't go. And when I went back, Judy said, I, I want to help you. I didn't have a manager. So there was this young lady who was a housewife, had no experience. She said, I'll try and help you out. And she called the Los, Los Angeles television station 29 times for me to appear on their telethon, 29 times. And on the 30th call, Gene Brown, who was the producing producer, the manager in Los Angeles, answered a phone and said, OK, we can put your record on at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or on a Sunday morning. It was a 48 hour telethon. 
So I went over there and uh, had a few songs and, and I was asked to rehearse and uh, rehearse and the producer said, do you have any other songs? I said, yeah. How many have you have? I got about six or seven. He said, we use all of them. So I did the telethon. I sang the six or seven songs. And then he said, you got any more? I said, I don't have songs, but I have a, a prose. He said, what's that? I said, it's a prose called To a Sleeping Beauty about a father declaring his love very silently while his daughter is sleeping in a bedroom. And it's called To a Sleeping Beauty. So I recited it. Guess what? I got asked to do it again, and then asked to, uh, to do it a third time. And for the third time, they had a young actress called Kathy Lee Johnson as pretending to be the mother of the child and a young child with a prosthetic arm and prosthetic leg. And so when I was reciting it, I looked at the child and I got emotional and I choked and I couldn't. The producer came and that's exactly the reaction I wanted. But more importantly, Kathy Lee Johnson later on became a top TV personality. She became Kathy Lee Gifford. And because her husband was the number one football player in America. And I would really like to catch up with her because I, I have the footage of her doing that to a sleeping beauty. And uh, and your listeners or your viewers, if they get a chance, I, it could be on the YouTube called To a Sleeping Beauty. It is possibly one of the the most beautiful set of words as a prose I have shared with with my audiences since 1974, 76. Yeah. Another 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 great anecdote there. If I can, if I can, if I now can go about, you know, you're living in Sydney uh, in the 1970s, 80s. You know, you got a family of your own. Um, um, your wife is, you know, from Fiji of Indian background. Your, your children, you know, probably around my generation uh, growing up. Um, did they feel by then, um, did you feel by then Australia was their home? They were welcome, they were growing up. Um, you know, Australia had become a bit more multicultural, the white Australia policy, the last vestiges of it had finished in the early 70s. Um, yeah. what, what was the dynamic there? You know, you, you were I, a public I, person. I, I, don't think, I don't think children experience any form of segregation. If anything, uh, uh, you know, that they, 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 they were regarded as my children. I mean, they were recognized as uh, our children and uh, they enjoyed it, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember my son one day took him to school and uh, so I got into my wife's car and uh, I said, let's go. He said, I'm not going to in that car. I want to go in the Rolls Royce. I said, who do you think you are? He said, I'm son of Kamal. <laughs> <laughs> but his attitude has changed somewhat since then. But no, no, no. I think, you know, and by the way, talking about children, we have a 17-year-old, a very beautiful granddaughter called Izzy. And uh, so, so our daughter, Rani, has done a, Fantastic job as a mother and her husband Michael Michael Flynn as uh, the, the father of. And where did they live? They live in Singapore. Did you mention that to in me? Singapore, yeah, in Singapore, yeah. yeah. That and connection. She, you won't believe uh, she has done two plays, and she's an actress. And uh, uh, I don't know whether it's going to be a career, but she's done extraordinarily well. And uh, it, she didn't get it from me. Must have <laughs> got it from her father. You know, but uh, how long? How long has she been living in Singapore? Uh, oh, for most of it, she was born in Singapore and came mm -hmm. and lived here and then then went back for the last... I haven't seen them for two years now. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe with a bit of luck, Ronnie, uh, my daughter might come back for my 80th, 88th birthday. But otherwise, uh, one of the things, if, if there is time before you go, I want to leave something with you. You can leave it out, put it in or whatever. Uh, basically about my 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 basic attitude towards life when the time comes when you finish with this uh, you, you can I, I will I will it will take two minutes to do it so I'll do that for you so be, before we go any further I forgot to mention to the online audience that the chat function is on um, we're coming up to an hour so that we're, we're going to go for another half an hour um, finishing at um, uh, 
7.30 p.m. Perth time and uh, 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 9.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. But please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type them. I know uh, some of you in the audience, uh, you know, have been have, have we've had discussions about it, and you have had very interesting insights and comments prior to this to this session. So I really do welcome uh, the questions in the in the in the chat, uh, and and we'll uh, we'll we'll um, we'll read it out to. Um, so it's not the chat function; it's the Q and A function. I've I've just been reminded. It's the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen for the audience. Um, okay. Thank you very uh, much. Let me, if I may, Brendan, I might as well take this opportunity to, to tell you, you know, each of us need a, 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 a guidebook, you know, like a, I don't know, we all sometimes we turn to religion, this, uh, whatever it is, you know. And I came across these words in 1972. And the irony of it was, it was a number one hit uh, or top five hit around the world. It was called Desiderata. Desiderata, uh, it's called uh, the, the way of life, you know, and uh, in Latin, I think it means that. And they promoted it as if though these words were found in a disused church in Baltimore. Why they had to make up those stories, I don't know, but it was really written by Max Ehrman in 19, 19, 19, 1926. 1926. And this became a big hit. And the guy who did it, Les Crane, did it. And at the end of it, when I first heard it, I thought there is something wrong and I couldn't work out what it was. And then I heard it again. And maybe on the third hearing, I realized what it was. But I won't dwell on it now, but I will share this with you called Desert, The Way of Life. Go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others. Even the dull and ignorant, they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to their spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter. For always, there'll be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery, but let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all erudity and disenchantment, it is perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune but do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here, and whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive God to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul, with all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams. It is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Yes, be cheerful and strive strive to be happy that's it thank you that's fantastic I've, I've i've heard you recite that many times in recordings so uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to to have you do um that recitation here i mean we weren't expecting this this wasn't part of the script 
<laughs> the, uh, the irony uh, was, the irony that when it was number one, the the opening, the closing line is it instead of being cheerful, is it be careful and strive to be happy, which makes nonsense of the whole damn thing. And yet it was number one. <laughs> In other words, people don't really listen and people don't really see, you know, and that's why we still have so many charlatans uh, ruling us. We won't go I do there. have a few <laughs> questions. I do have a few questions. One, uh, you know, after your recitation said, beautiful, thank you. It was from an anonymous attendee. Um, another one is a comment. Um, uh, I'll read it out. Kamal will remember my grandfather, Harold Williams, from Sydney Conservatorium. I certainly remember how proud of Kamal, he and my grandmother, Doki, were. Congratulations on your wonderful career. And that's come from Jane Tozo. Um, is she, wait a minute, is she still there, is she? Yes, she's, uh, she's online and she's-, uh, she's tell, her, uh, tell her I had the, or two or nearly three wonderful years with Harold. In fact, I think uh, they gave me a crystal, uh, crystal bowl and that I still have, and and I sh uh, and I, I I think of them regularly with that. And uh, it, you know, we talked about cricket of the half hour lesson. We talked about we had ten minutes of singing and twenty minutes of cricket. <laughs> and uh, but he, he would have been envious to know that I became a friend of Sir Donald Bradman. That he I couldn't tell him that story because. I uh, find I met Don Bradman in 55, 1955, and then in 88. And uh, and I have about maybe, would you believe, about 60 letters from Sir Donald Bradman. And we had so many wonderful memories. And uh, I could do a whole show about Sir Donald Bradman and, and go through some of his letters. It's, it's just an amazing privilege to have met him. And, and the Another irony was, the irony was he was like less than 200 yards away, and it took me 33 years to meet him after the first time. We've got a question from John Goodlad, the previous uh, uh, past president of the AWAA, and um, and his, his, his question, I'll read it out. You sang, what is Australia to me? Uh, would you like to reflect on the lyrics? Do you still have the same sentiment? Um, Okay. I mean, the question is, I ask your viewers, what is Australia to you? And to me, it's a house I live in, my neighbors down the street, the proud and smiling faces of the people that I meet, the children in the playground and Christmas in the sun, the g'day and the handshake, that's Australia to me, the town I live in, the friends that I have found, the people who just came here from nations all around, those who built this country, the air of feeling free and the right to speak your own mind. That's Australia to me. Words of Banjo Patterson, McCullough and Henry Lawson. The style of Donald Bradman, De Costello and Dame Joan. They're Smithy and Ben Lexon, achievers without peers. And the dreaming of a people who've been here a million years. This land I live in, the goodness everywhere a place of wealth and beauty with enough for all to share. Yes, I love this sunburned country, so vital, young and free, with a promise for tomorrow that's Australia to me. But it's the people. Yes, especially the people. That's Australia to me. Fabulous. I think you've answered your question that, you know, you obviously still have that same sentiment and emotion um, for the country, uh, the country that you've spent 70 years in uh, coming up to. Do you, and I'll take the opportunity to reflect because we are on the bigger theme of Australia. Um, you know, you, you keep, you know, you, you, you make the point that, you know, you, you're an entertainer and you were, you, were, you know, you were not necessarily following politics very closely, but how have you? How do you see Australia today? If you could say, could you imagine in 1953 or in the early 50s that Australia will be like it was, like it is today? Um, the multiculturalism, the obviously the wealth that 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 ha, that we've grown, um, the, 
obviously the modernity, but that's everywhere in the world. But Australia as a, as a nation, in, 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 you know, you grew up in it, um, you know, as, as initially as a foreigner. But, you know, I mean, the thing is, uh, I don't think my life is an example for anybody. I mean, I, I, I just don't know how I survived, you know. I, maybe I was cunning, but I didn't deceive anybody. I tried my best. For some odd reason, people seem enjoyed with the noises I make. My mom didn't like it, but the, the rest of the people liked it. And so, I don't know, I can't explain. All I know is I try to do my best. Uh, I haven't tried to deceive anybody. Maybe, you know, if I if I did, I, I, it was never intentional. And I, and I come back to the other thing. The greatest thing we ever learn is to love and be loved in return. And the, that's the that's the basic motivating principle that I, I live by. And uh, and to me, words more than music uh, brings me closer to the people that I want to uh, link with. And uh, and that those words about Australia, would you believe during the bicentenary, they rejected it one hundred percent. They didn't want to know. I also wrote, I also recorded a song called My Home which from the point of view of an FBA foreign born Australian, even that was rejected. Mm -hmm. But that yeah, I live with those sort of rejections as well. And, uh, you know, you're the not, irony- You're not at all bitter by it, you know, and that's that's wonderful because you 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 you, you celebrate your successes and and you don't dwell on, on those things that perhaps uh, you would have liked uh, different outcomes for. Yeah, I mean, I think that what my, perhaps my greatest disappointment was, let me put it in an indirect way. You know the song I still call Australia Home? Yeah. Okay, and Peter Allen wrote it. He he sang it when he was in, in America. I, I still call Australia Home. It is sung by people who've never left Australia. Trying to work, the, uh, trying to work out the sentiment. I still call Australia Home and they've never left Australia. And yet it became a huge hit. So I record a song called My Home. You know, this, this is my home, this is my country. And about a man or a person who came from another country and this Australia gave me my new home. And like the other one, what is Australia to me, this was rejected 100%. And still it's waiting to be heard. But unfortunately, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I gave up when they didn't want it for the bicentenary concert. I it for six months I I, I was mentally crippled. I, I I just felt ruined, you know. I just felt the, this is the two most important songs I've done, and they didn't want to hear it, and and I felt so disappointed. But anyway, uh, occasionally on an early morning trip to the to, to television stations, I would sing my home to the taxi driver. And if it is a new Australian or if it, you know, if it's an immigrant, I can bet you a hundred times they 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 cry or they hear listening to the yes. song. Not because I my singing is so bad, but they love the sentiments, you know. But yeah, but then you know, these are the the pros and cons. I mean, sometimes the hurt <coughs> during rejection hurts deeper. With you know, my the rejection of my home and what is Australia to me is possibly the the worst hurt or the deepest hurt. Mm. But fortunately, I still sing them, and uh, you just heard the words of what is Australia to me. But uh, I think that, that says something about, I guess, the you know what you've expressed throughout our whole conversation, which is your 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 gratitude uh, to Australia and the opportunities that it, it gave you. Um, Notwithstanding the time and the challenges and 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 you know the hiding from the immigration officers and um, and so that that the 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 end result is is this 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 spirit of generosity and gratitude that I that I really feel that's, uh, yeah, that you're I mean, expressing. You know, I mean, it's uh, I, I you know I I don't know. I mean, it's just that. I think in some ways I've been incredibly lucky and in some ways it was a pity that I couldn't have uh, 
maximized on it. You know, financially, I could have made 10 times the amount of, of you know. So I didn't have somebody to uh, have an agent, man manager, and all of these happening at the same time, which was, how can I put it? It's, you know, it's, it's, it was a, that was a bit of a mess, but never mind. But I'm, I'm new, I'm doing a new biography called, but for the kindness of strangers, because but for the kindness of strangers go I, and that's the title of my new book. And, uh, and I hope maybe I haven't finished yet. Somebody else is writing it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Keith, uh, Keith, uh, is, is writing it. And, and, and I hope, uh, I'll be able to put in a lot of the things I haven't been able to tell you right now. You know, I've got another camera. question. I've got another yeah. question. Um, a couple it. more. Um, Sonia Arakal. Um, her question is, and and it's something that I guess I was trying to tease out, um, but she's more eloquent in that as she always is. Um, is there a role for Australian song and music? in what is called soft power diplomacy, trying to project Australia's image abroad. Does Australia use its artistic talent enough in projecting this image, in projecting its diplomacy? Um, you've been involved a little bit in that. I know you took part in the big international song conference in Brazil. Um, is that something you saw through your career as something that could have been done better, more by officials? <laughs> You know, I mean, look, uh, we, late, you know, there was a friend, my Olivia Newton-John, and an Australian girl. I, I met her. In fact, I was there in 1976 after my concert at Carnegie Hall. I was with Olivia. It went to a ballet at the Washington uh, Theater to see De Margot Fontaine do Merry Widow. Uh, I think talent is talent, and uh, and there have been some great Australian talents. Some of them are known and some of them are not. They, they are, you know, I mean, uh, so many Australian talent. I mean, Peter Allen lived in New York and, and, and gave so much uh, of Australia to America. Yeah, I mean, if, if there is talent, I mean, there is plenty of talent. And uh, it's a question of opportunities uh, uh, and finding the right people at the right time. You know, uh, Bas Lohman, for example, I mean, he's done some incredible things. and. Uh, yeah, you know, and I'm not close to uh, what's happened. Sometimes I'm too narrow-minded about minding about what I got to do, you know. And uh, so again, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't have people to lean on and say, "Can you do that? Can you, you know, to to uh, delegate my uh, my priorities mm -hmm. to other people so that I don't have to think of everything else." And uh, so, you know, in a way, I've been my not worst enemy. I've, I haven't been my own good friend, but I would like to have been. But, uh, you, you know, I, I think, I, you know, I, I, having, I, been, I, having been, and I thought, I know people in this call who've, you know, been professional diplomats or who are in the audience, very senior professional diplomats. You know, if I look back, even, you know, during my career as an Australian diplomat, um, we could have done, you know, we could have done with a Kamal um, in, in, in helping us round off, round up Australia's image of the world. You know, you know, the Australia was known for, you know, its entertainers, like, as you mentioned, Oliver Newton-John and, and, and others, Nicole Kidman in more recent times, you know, we, we celebrated their success. We, we latched on to their Australianness. Um, and I think um, I, I won't be among, I won't be in the minority of, you know, prof former professional diplomats who would think, well, you know, that was an opportunity gone missing, you know, to, 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 to use, you know, to use Kamal in those years as, as, you know, as part of, you know, a concerted effort to say, hey, Australia is changing, Australia is now, because that was, that was a reflection of what was going on. And I think now we're doing it, um, you know, the whole thing about indigenous art as well, you know, in the, you know, that, you know, that came up and it's a great addition to Australia's uh, cultural identity, indigenous culture as a whole, but also you were, we're starting to see um, Australians of all different shades and colors uh, representing the country, dummy in, you know, uh, Australia's uh, um, selected contestant in, um, in Eurovision and um, um, Guy Sebastian, another person with Malaysian origins, 
and the like. Uh, I think, you know, you are ahead of your time. And, and I think um, if we look back, we, we could have done a lot more. Um, you know, people, you know, um, in, in, in positions of power who are, who are sort of managing Australia's image in the world, particularly in Asia. And I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that's not a miss only for you. It's a miss for us and it's a miss for the country. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I would have liked to have done a bit more as an Australian citizen uh, uh, to 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 be bring the society be more cohesive. Um, for whatever reason, uh, I didn't lean on any of the political leaders, and there were sometimes invitations. I some I accept I accepted, and some I didn't. Uh, but I would have liked to have done more. Uh, 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 but that's the way. Uh, that's the way the chips fall, you know. But uh, one of oh, but one of the things, if you'll allow me to brag, I have to ask you a question. In 1978, Saturday Night Fever was number one album around the world, except in one country. And where was it? And which which album was number one instead? I think maybe for two weeks. Ask, ask your listeners, in 1978, if that was the year, Saturday Night Fever was number one album everywhere in the world, except one country. And where was it? You want me to put you out of your misery? Yes, please. I'm guessing New Zealand, but... It was New Zealand. In fact, <laughs> I think it put it for two years. I mean, there's a reason for it. I won't go into that and spoil it, but uh, I was surprised. In fact, I saw the foot. In fact, if you're interested, I can give you the actual uh, chart. Uh, and and uh, what, was what, the, is what was the album? Just called Kamal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and uh, it was 1978, and uh, there's a reason for it. I won't spoil it by telling you why. And. Uh, I, I'm happy to, you know, when you're editing all of this, you can put it there and uh, show the the actual chart. Yeah, we'll put it on. We'll put it on the link uh, to the. Uh, yeah, you know, in other words, you should be able to. You know, okay, I'll email it to you anyway. Yeah. Um, Another couple of comments uh, and one question um, from Jean Mangram. Hi, Kamal. You look so healthy at your age. Do you have any other longevity secrets besides the desiderata? Well, look, all I can tell you, the life is more about perception than reality. The perception is, you no. Know, what we see in here, we tend to believe. We believe 90% or even more. And the reality is very little. And so I, I, so I appeal to the perception. That's why I wear a caftan. And I do anything I can to, to create an illusion. That's why I drove a Rolls Royce for the last 20 years, because uh, they they thought more about the car than me. <laughs> so, you have you, you a know. great. I, I I was reading the great back the great story behind the kaftan you, and um, and a certain and a certain famous singer from Southern Europe. Do you do you do you want to share that story? Which one? Um, I I understood that you got inspiration to wear the kaftan among others from from uh, Demi Rousseau's. Oh, yeah. OK. I mean, in 1972, you referred to the International Song Competition. I uh, I was in that competition. Uh, he didn't win it and I didn't win it. David Clayton Thomas from Blood, Sweat and Tears uh, sang it. And when he sang, he had a, a pitch black girl in a bikini uh, playing bongos. And there was no way, it doesn't matter what he sang, he was bound to win it anyway. And uh, but with Demis Russo's, he pranced around all over the place with a with a what it wasn't a dress, it wasn't a captain, it was a halfway type of an attire. So the following year, 1973, when I had to do my own concert at Carnegie uh, at the Opera House, I again with this perception, with this idea that the perception is more important than the reality. So I got myself uh, made myself a gold captain. And didn't I didn't know what to wear, so I went barefoot, and uh, so I was named as a caftan kid. And I, I don't think they they listened so much as watched what I was doing. So it's in other words, it's like it's a magic show, you know. You so that you don't know how, how it's done, but uh, you know it's done. <coughs> if you know what I mean. 
So the, yeah, I, I, I recall that album, as I said in the early, you know, in the album we had you. Camel at the Opera House. Yes. Now, let me, let me go through that story. The Opera House may, may not have happened because early in 73, my then uh, temporary agent, forget his, I won't mention his name, he came to me uh, with a contract and the contract listed 12 people or a dozen people, oh, about 10 people who were going to do the big concert for 2CH at the Opera House in 1973 during the opening, during the opening season. I looked at the contract and gave it back to him. And he said, uh, what's wrong with it? I said, if, if I have to explain to you what's wrong with it, uh, I don't need you. With that, he got extremely angry. And he said, my other actives, uh, my other acts have more talent in their little finger than you have in your whole body. I told him, I said, I agree with you 100%, but please don't tell too many other people about it. So he left in disgust. And then I wrote to 2CH and I said, look, you've invited me to take part in your concert for you with all these other people, but I have an idea. I'd like to do my own concert at uh, Kamal at the Opera House. Uh, if it doesn't suit, I'll understand. So they agreed. So they said, okay, let's do it. And then last minute I said, let's almost record it. My record company said, look, let's not waste money uh, with the, if the sound is no good, let the other people like the Ralph Harris of this world go in there, let them do their thing. We'll go two years later and do a really good recording. And I said, you do that in the meantime, I'm going to do it. So I paid for it and recorded it. And then eventually they refunded me. So uh, that, you know, these are the sort of things that happen again and again in my life where uh, unwittingly or unwittingly I have stuck my neck out and occasionally I had it chopped and occasionally survived uh, the decapitation, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's the story of my life, mean, meaning that uh, there is a an instinct, I don't know whether what it is, my survival instinct, and I have come up with, with ideas. Like, I'll give you this perfect example, 1970. Having already had success with Sounds of Goodbye, which had a lot of, which launched my my career as a recording artist, I had, I came across another song called "All I Have to Offer You Is Me," and the record was sitting opposite the producer Dermot Hoy, and I looked at him and I said, "I love the title of this song. I know this was already recorded by Charlie Pride." But do you mind very much not releasing this? Let me do it and release Charlie's a few months later. He agreed. So we recorded it. And before we released it, there was an industrial dispute and none of the Commonwealth records were being played in Australia. So karma came in and, and they struck me dead. So all I have to offer you uh, got, got nowhere. So while I was licking my wounds in Melbourne, in maybe September of 1970, uh, there was a knock on the door and three of my fans, uh, three mature ladies walked in. They said, you don't look very happy. I said, I got nothing to be happy about. So I told them what had happened. They said, oh, in that case, just put the song on television. That was the stupidest thing I could have heard. You know, I mean, it made no sense to me. And then they explained that they were sales, uh, sales uh, force with the World Book Encyclopedia, and they do. They appear on the show called uh, the the uh, Bob Dyer Picker Box on BP. So that was it. And I remember B them saying BP, and they I couldn't wait for them to leave the room. And uh, as I shut the door as they were leaving, I turned back, went to the went to the window, and there I could see the BP sign at the end of the road. So I picked up the phone and I dialed BP and I said, I'd like to speak to your advertising manager. And a man called Rod Taylor, he's just passed away sadly, came on the phone and he said, I said, my name is Kamal. It didn't mean a damn thing to him. He says, what can I do for you? And I said, I got an idea. I'm gonna make an album. I'll give it to you as a gift. If you make any money out of it, give all that money to your favorite charity. I just want people to hear my song and they don't like it. Uh, the, you know, uh, nothing gained, nothing lost, okay? And he hung up and uh, that was it. So next thing he called me 20 minutes later, he said, what was that idea again? I had no idea why he called me back 
uh, 20 minutes later. I found out 20 years later, it was because his, his assistant had heard me and she must have done a bit of a rave about me. And that was the reason. So we got together. I did an album called Peace on Earth. And guess what? When an album went 8,000 or 10,000 would have been gold, in 1970, at the end of 1970, the BP album by, uh, in Peace on Earth, available only on service station, we did 135. In fact, according to the figures, the, the directors, they told me if they, if they could have had printed, they could have printed 250, sold all of them, but they couldn't get a print anywhere in Sydney, Singapore, or anywhere, New Zealand to print because it was the end of the season. Everybody, well, the, the press was busy. So that bizarre so idea. Said, but, so so you, you became the only recording artist to exclusively, exclusively sell a record in gas stations. I just came up with the idea out of desperation. You know, I mean, out, out of nothing. It was a total failure of all I have to offer you. All I have to offer you was nothing. And all of a sudden, all I have to offer you was peace on earth, which was, I still haven't equaled the success of that. That was 1970. <laughs> so it's nothing, but little to do with my singing ability. It's about the ideas and the passion. And, 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 and uh, you know, maybe I, I, maybe I tried too hard sometimes, but I, I did succeed and got kicked in the teeth along the way and uh, took the blows and, uh, you know, uh, and here I am still standing. I got one more question I have, and I got a question from Ron Mitchell, but my one first, and then I'll end with Ron's. Um, food. I, I hear, I read the story. I've heard you speak about it. When you first came to Australia, you were exclusively on a egg and milk diet um, or something like that. Um, and and, what? and, and okay. today, what... Me... Okay, I... My my uh, auntie used to give my sister, who came of age, some raw eggs. So when when, when the time came here in, in Australia, so I had raw eggs, cake, biscuits, ice cream, anything but the regular food. So that that was the diet for the first two and a half or three years. So raw eggs, I don't eat, eat raw eggs anymore, but that, that's what I lived. Was that because for. you were vegetarian and you weren't uh, you were not? Um, you didn't feel secure eating the food at the school? Or uh, yeah, the I, I sort of, uh, not a, a staunch vegetarian, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, basically I ate uh, all the sweet things, basically, you know, I mean, uh, uh, cakes and ice cream and uh, uh, any of the, all, all the goodies, you know. Okay. And, uh, well, you've seen the journey with Australian food now, and, uh, you know, uh, Australia now has, you know, arguably some of the best multicultural food in the world and uh, again that's a that's the story of our of our I, multicultural journey i would like to be i would like to be their ambassador and i, I would <laughs> like to be their guinea pig but uh my, my 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 diet is i dare not tell you in public what i what i eat and uh no my i have a in fact i've got i've got diabetes and but and i'm on on tablets but in spite of it i'm having too much sweet but uh, <laughs> life is too short uh, i would rather have the sweet and have kidney problems and not have sweet. But anyway. So Ron Mitchell, a... Ron Mitchell, uh, one is a comment. Thank you uh, for your wisdom and stories, Kamal. You are truly inspirational. I think we all can agree with that sentiment tonight. Um, he has a, a, a question. Do you still keep in touch with, you know, the, the, the person to whom you, I guess, call your savior, Rupert Murdoch? Uh, what's the relationship like yes, today? In, in fact, in fact, uh, my last uh, correspondence with him wasn't all that, uh, he, I didn't get all that good a response because uh, this was almost two years ago. I, I texted him or letter, uh, wrote a letter to him. I said, I have a dream that the White House will have a lady uh, there one day, not expecting Kamala Harris, Harris to be vice, vice president. But what I was expecting or what I was trying to tell him was maybe with a bit of luck, she would be the next president. And, uh, and his reply was, Elizabeth Warren was a stronger candidate, so uh, so we don't we don't have much in common as far as politics politics is concerned. 
Fair enough. I think yeah. um, you know we've had a we've 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 had an hour and a half of, of a of a brilliant conversation, a real pleasure and a real honor to to uh, engage with you, Kamal. Uh, as I said, you know, in my introduction, um, you know, I've I've known about you since I was maybe four years old, five years old, uh, living in Malaysia, and and you were seen as this, you know, great success story, you know, of somebody from from Malaysia who had made it on the world stage. Um, and uh, you know it's been fantastic learning about your story in preparation for this for this discussion. And it, and, uh, okay, uh, this is something uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, when Prince Harry had the you know the Harris uh, you know the Prince Harry's games, Invictus Games, I I knew the poem Invictus because Nelson Mandela believed in it. He wrote the words of Invictus in his prison wall and re recited it or went through it every morning. And uh, so I read it and uh, inspired me. And I was very disappointed that I couldn't get a chance to uh, be anywhere near the uh, uh, Invictus Games. By a miracle, like what's happened in my life, with a week to go, there is me, I'm standing in front of Prince Harry to recite this poem out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments a scroll i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul Thank you. Why Thank you. this? Why this poem is not in everybody's lips? I will never know. Thank you very much. That that's a beautiful way okay. to end our conversation. Uh, I'm sure we will keep in touch. And um, thank you again uh, from on behalf of the audience, the members, and guests of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, Kamal, uh, your I know you've been very. Um, humble about it, but you know, your kind of journey um, for people like myself uh, as immigrants to this, this great country, um, you, you are a pioneer, uh, you, you showed, you know, what could be done. Um, yes, you had luck along the way, but I think, um, you, you know, you, 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 you were a, to a certain, to a certain degree, a model, you cannot see, you cannot be what you cannot see. Um, and, you know, as a person in the public profile of your background coming, you know, coming to Australia as a migrant and achieving that, I think, uh, I think it's something that people like me uh, definitely hold up as a, as a great example. So I wish you good night and I wish the audience good night. Thank you very much again for your time and all the work and the preparation for this. Uh, um, and good luck um, in your next steps. Your biography will keep it. We'll keep a lookout for it, and I'll definitely be one of those who are the first purchasers of it. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan, and uh, thanks to the kindness of strangers. And uh, but for them, go I. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank good you. Good night.